Well, we started to see in the late 90s and early parts of the 2000s where we had an excessive amount of precipitation come through the area. And um, through that, we saw uh, consequences that came from that was water tables that got saturated and salts that started to come to the surface. And so producers were losing uh, production areas because of these saline seeps that had started. So producers start to come in and they start to ask questions about alternatives on how they can address these resource concerns and how they can solve these and get them back into a productive state. Um, and we offer them alternatives. So we look at providing them alternatives like cover crops, um, putting it into permanent vegetation. Uh, we look at crop uh, rotations and residue management as uh, ways of improving the overall fertility and bringing back and reducing the effects of these salinity areas. We've seen a, a, a decrease in the diversity of our crop rotations and we've also seen um, more of our, uh, what I kind of refer to as our absorption zones that are out in the watersheds have been broke and now are being planted to conventional crops. And the other thing is I think that the, the other Probably the biggest thing is our crop rotations. We, we've gone from having four or five crops in our rotations and reduce that down to a two crop rotation where we're looking at primarily corn and soybeans. And what that's done is it's ultimately, by planting those soybeans out there, it's reduced the amount of organic matter that we're producing out there. We've, we're not getting as much water usage, so we're not managing the subsoils the way that we were uh, back when we had these more diverse rotations. So I think those ultimately have led to the effects that we're seeing now on the soils. And ultimately, we've got to figure out a way to provide alternatives to producers that they can go out there and feasibly go out and manage their land in a sustainable way that will allow them to um, be able to have future generations produce crops on those on those acres. We've uh, always uh, kind of known they've been a problem just in anecdotal stories from farmers. Uh, we had a previous NRCS SIG grant that was funded where we were looking at planting cover crops uh, into corn at V6. And we had uh, some saline areas that we worked with with some farmers up in this area in Redfield all the way up to Aberdeen. Uh, what actually happened was is that I would bring some of the soils back to use in my classes uh, during fall and uh, spring semester and when we would start working with these soils it was very apparent that a lot of the, um, the indexes that we use, the sodium absorption ratio or uh, actually the exchangeable sodium percent, the numbers did not seem to make sense for our soils here in uh, South Dakota and North Dakota. Here where we are in northeastern South Dakota, southeastern North Dakota, our problem is the salts are coming up from our high water table. And uh, so that's one thing that we wanted to look at. So we identify the problem and we start looking at trying to provide uh, solutions. When I talk with farmers and we are thinking about management, the first thing I tell them is they have to test for their salts. The calcium and the magnesium salts are salinity problems which must be managing separately from the, the sodium problems. So when you soil test for salts, um, there's a couple different uh, 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 analysis methods that you need to ask your lab. Uh, the first one is electrical conductivity, or EC. Okay? And that is what we use to measure total salts with. The other test would be testing for sodium. Sodium, like I said, is a different problem. The test that is typically run by our labs in the upper Midwest with exchangeable sodium percent. We have a couple different options. Uh, the exchangeable sodium percent is a test that's easier for the labs to do so they can turn, you, turn over the answer to you in a shorter period of time. Another test that we do use is the sodium absorption ratio um, and that's not used as much because it takes much longer for the labs to do that. I think with our, with our no-till systems that we've seen, we've seen a decline in our no-till systems over the last uh, uh, probably five to 10 years here in Spink County. Uh, this county was at one point probably about 85% no-till. And a lot of that has come from the change in the climate and the amount of residue that a lot of the new varieties of, of crops produce, especially on the corn end of things with our corn, uh, or with our crop rotations going to a corn soybean rotation. So I think what, um, I think what we're seeing is 
that they're trying to reduce the amount of residue so that they can get those crops up sooner and earlier that they can germinate and get up and growing, they're going to help maximize their yield potential. But there's other producers that are using those, those small grains in the rotations that aren't seeing the problems with their, their excessive uh, residues in their no-till system. So again, it kind of goes back to having sound management strategies with their crop rotations and their residue management. Right, the biology of everything all works better when you have that small grain uh, crop in, in the mix. Uh, the way the, the, in a corn soybean rotation, the corn stock, which is the, the primary source of the issue, is not breaking down because it's simply sitting on the surface. So there's nothing there to get it down to the microorganisms that are going to break it down and turn it into something useful and productive for that, um, that current year crop.